Welcome to Israel. Don't go outside. Don't yeah, go we, li we, live in what, we live in what one of our teachers called E Shviut Veroga, sensibility <laughs> and tranquility. And so we're just thankful for that in our yes. isolation, well, as just, it were. <clears throat> let's just thank God for, for every all our blessings. Amen. And, and be careful out there. And let's <laughs> give, give God, a, God a hand. Oh, dear. Okay, anyway, welcome to Israel. I wish you were here under happier circumstances, but looking around the world, this is probably just about the safest country to be in right now. We, we, th this is a very strange country. This country is chaos all the time, except when there's a real emergency. When there's a real <laughs> emergency, we gather ourselves together and we, for the most part, um, behave ourselves, and I think we're going to to save a lot of lives by having done that. And who knows whether it's mine, yours, Halvers, Miriam's, but that's the most important thing that to, to save lives here. Or everything else will will fall back into place, and this will all be a distant memory, hopefully, sometime. Well, memory. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the uh, memories of the biblical period 2500 years ago going back to okay going back to the time of the ninth of av in the summer of 587 bc when the armies of nebuchadnezzar the second king of babylon completed the conquest of jerusalem destroying the first temple which solomon son of david had built more than 300 years beforehand. With the fall of Judea, King Zedekiah, fall of Judah, the King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah was put to death, the temple was destroyed, and large portions of the population of Jerusalem, Judah, and the surrounding areas was taken off into exile in Babylonia. Okay, there we go. These new exiles, these new exiles, I'm, I'm just, sorry, I'm just getting everything lined up. These new exiles joined communities that already existed in the ancient, in ancient Iraq, which go back through, uh, formally at least, to 721 BC, to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel and the exile of the 10 lost tribes. And we can see this here, I'm, I give you as text, a, the Israelites followed the sinful ways practiced by Jeroboam. They did not stray from it until God removed Israel from his sight, as he had foretold through all his prophets. So Israel was exiled from its land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria then brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvim, and settled them in the cities of Samaria instead of the Israelites. And they, the people from the exiles from the foreign lands took possession of Samaria and settled its cities. This is the beginnings of the formal diaspora in ancient Mesopotamia, the formal Jewish diaspora. To these people would be added other individuals, both northerners, Israelites, and southerners, Judean. And then with the, um, with, in the new world of the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, in his suppression of continuing Judean attempts at independence, would exile others to Babylonian soil. In this particular text you see here, it's a chronicle of Nebuchadnezzar II, and we can translate it as follows. In the seventh year, in the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his army and marched to Hatu, marched to the Westland. He encamped against the city of Judah. The Hebrew is Ir Yehuda, and this is a name for Jerusalem. The formula Ir country or city country is the capital city or major city. So Jerusalem is Ir Yehuda today. Um, New York City might be considered Ir Arzotabrit, the Ir um, United States, London, Ir England, and so on. And on the second day of the month of Adar, he captured the city, seized the king, a king of his own choice, he appointed in the city, taking vast tribute with him back into Babylonia. 
thus among the exiles of 721, 701, this exile in 597, and then the final, then the exile of 587, 586, the destruction of Jerusalem and the um, conquest of Judah, we find people from very different Israelite and Judean social and economic groups. In the Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, we find the upper echelons of the society. He captured the city and seized the king. And we know this not only from the biblical sources, but also from Babylonian rationalists, which give us rations provided by the king to his quote-unquote royal guests. For example, 10 liters of oil to Yehoachin, king of Judah, two and a half liters for the five sons of the king of Judah, four liters for the eight Judeans, one half liter for each. But in addition to these people, there were many others, commoners, the people of the land who were settled along the canal system of Babylonia and settled, settled in the rural areas along the canal system of Babylonia. Scenes that we can see, for example, here. Here they were settled along the Naru, Naratu in Akkadian, a word which means both river and canal. The only difference between a river and a canal is one of chronology. Rivers are dug by the gods before the creation of man. After man is created to do the menial work in the universe, it is the people who dig the canals. These words are cognate to Hebrew nahar naharot. So nahar naharot in the Hebrew Bible in a Babylonian context can mean canal as well as river. Hence, we can translate al naharot bavel by the rivers of Babylon as by the canals of Babylon, or maybe better by the river and canal systems of Babylon. And of course, this is one of the most famous moving verses of the, the Hebrew Bible. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Moving on, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget the O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. And so begins the formal Babylonian exile. An exile which was visited, an exiled community which was visit, visited, for example, by the prophet Ezekiel. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chabar, al Nahar Kvar, by the river canal Chabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And we go on to verse 3 And the word of the Lord came expressively unto Ezekiel, the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, al Nahar Kvar, by the river canal Kvar, by the Chabar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him can see the text there. Well, what is this river Chabar? It's the, in Akkadian, it's the Kabaru Canal. It's written out syllabically. It's the same word that we have in Hebrew. And this sign here is a, a um, indicator for river. So it's river or canal Kabaru. But what does Kabar mean? Well, if we look at Hebrew poetry, where are we here? I lost my place. Well, I don't know what I want. Oh, here we are. There we are. The Hulal Umolid Sadiq Kabir. Great, tremendous. So the word exists in Hebrew as well. And it also exists in Babylonian, as in here. Here is id, ka, ba, ra. And kabar simply means great, like Allah akbar. Mm -hmm. And so what the Kabar River is, the Kabar Canal, 
It's the Grand Canal, it's the main canal of Babylonia. For example, the Kabar Canal, or Kabar Canal of Venice is the Grand Canal, or would be the Grand Canal of Venice. So it's along this Chabar Canal that we find the exile being played out. Let me go back one. Here, Jeremiah 27, 4, 7, for example. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all the captivity that I have been caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem unto Babylon, saying, build yourselves houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take yourself wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and not be diminished and seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord for it for in this peace you will find peace. And this is the great blueprint of Jeremiah for the building of a diaspora. And so this indeed happened in Babylonia. The Judeans leaving Judah went off into exile in Babylonia and they built their communities. For example, towns, Jewish communities in towns such as Bampadia and Sura, where in the generations and centuries to come, the Babylonian Talmud would be written. And in our period, the period immediately following the destruction of Jerusalem, or immediately fought, well, let's see, beforehand, and our period immediately following, okay, a little bit after, immediately following the destruction of the first temple, we find evidence now in cuneiform economic documents written in Babylonian, in Babylonian Akkadian, for a Jewish community in this area in central Babylonia south of Babylon, but in the vicinity of the ancient holy city of Nippur, the city of Kesh, Kakara, and Shurapak. Shurapak is the city of the flood hero, which will become important to us in a few minutes. This is where the Babylonian Sumerian Noah um, came from. And somewhere in this area were found this group of tablets that we're talking about today, the Al Yehudu tablet. In this community also was the city of Al Yehudu, Judah town, which was not this Jerusalem, but rather the new Jerusalem that was built on Babylonian soil. For example, we hear. Again, the chronicle, in the seventh year in the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his army and marched to the west. He encamped against the city of Judah, i.e. Jerusalem, al Yehudu. But when we move on to Babylonia, we have another al Yehudu, just like we have a New York in the new world, as opposed to York in the old world. And from those of you who know the United States, or the rest of the world. We have London in Ontario, we have Cairo in Illinois, we find, um, what's the city in Northern Australia? Um, I can't pull it out of my memory, but this phenomena is, is known to us. And of course, this was not limited to the modern world and the ancient world in the, in the area that we're talking about. We have, in addition to the New Jerusalem, we have a new Gaza and cities called Cherub and Hamat, which were new Cherub and Hamat in Babylonia instead of Syria. So, New Jerusalem, our economic tablets. The earliest tablets date to year 33 from the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. That's 572 BC. That's less than a generation after the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. From there onwards, from the generation of the destruction of the first temple, and from more than 2,500 years, Jews lived in Iraq. Now, we have to define uh, three terms here. I'm going to try and 
be careful and talk about Jews, Judeans, and Israelites. I'm going to use the term Judeans and Israelites to refer specifically and separately to people from the Southern Kingdom, Judah, as Judeans, and people from the Northern Kingdom, Israel, as Israelites. Jews, I will use an anachronistically to refer to both groups together. So you can then look at Jews, probably a mix of Judeans and Israelites, um, I would say 99.99% a mix of Judeans and Israelites. This is a, a topic of study in these materials. And they live in gener from generation to generation on Babylonian soil down to the foundation of the modern state of Israel, where we can also talk about Israelis and not just Israelites, which of course was the trigger for the mass aliyah of the Babylonian Jewish community in the late 40s and early 50s to Israel. Today, for example, when Corona has receded, you might be interested in taking a look at the Museum of the Babylonian Community in, um, in Yehud, interesting enough. And another name that is, um, the city of Yehud is, of course, another New Jerusalem, but in Judah itself. Okay, so this community, of course, is well known to us. The Babylonian Talmud, the, the Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Yehoiakim, Zedekiah, all these stories and the context between Judah and between the land of Israel and Babylonia are much, much, are, are much more ancient than our materials. They go all the way back to the time of the patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, who the biblical text, the book of Genesis tells us, came ultimately from a family from the city of Uror, a city of Ur, you are, in southern Iraq. Um, what, okay, 18a. So this, with the foundations of this Jewish community and return to the place from whence Abraham came forth, we're really now able to talk about um, Jewish demography in much the same way that we know it today, of the homeland and the diaspora. And we can trace diaspora communities and life in the diaspora down to the present day. For example, in the town of Roslyn on Long Island in the United States where I was born, and we can see, if we look closely, that the models of what a diaspora looks like and how you behave in diaspora in, um, in exile, waiting to return either by your undoing or for the time of the Messiah, as my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-parents were, were doing, um, how this way of life, of being part of a people in exile, is... Um, it's first really visible to us in the historical records from our archive. And therefore our archive not only has importance for Jewish history and biblical history, but has a tremendous importance and significance from a more general ethnographic, anthropological, sociological model. It's really, we're talking about Jewtown in Babylonia or one of a number of Jewtowns in Babylonia in much the same that in our world, we have Chinatown in New York and Chinatown in San Francisco, Chinatown in um, London, Japantown in San Francisco, and so on and so on. So again, oh, huh, funny, the map didn't open this time. It opened last time. Okay. the. Um, you should have seen the map of Abraham's migrations, but we don't have it here. And we know that Abraham, we're told in the biblical text that Abraham left the city of Ur in southern Iraq, went to Haran in northern Syria on, by the Turkish border, and then emigrated into the land of Israel. There, for the first time, Abraham entered into a land where we do already have a cuneiform archive. This is the Middle Bronze Age, which I believe and have argued extensively elsewhere forms a 
historiographical background for the patriarchal narrative. We don't yet have any evidence for the patriarchal narratives in the archeological or textual record of the land of Israel in cuneiform texts and so on. But a good case can be built that the world that's described in the book of Genesis goes back to the Middle Bronze Age. We do also have textual information which um, makes the, late, the Middle Bronze Age in the land of Israel 2000 to 1600 a historical period. For example, we can see here a fragment from the law code of, a fragment from a law code from the city of Chatzor in Northern Israel, which parallels the biblical um, laws of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The text is badly broken, but we can restore it. We have three parties in this text. We have the, a slave, the owner of the slave, and someone he rents the slave out to. If, a man, something, 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 10 shekels to the owner of the slave, he will weigh out. If a tooth, three shekels to the owner of the slave, he will weigh out. So what looks like is happening here is I have a slave, but I don't have anything for him to do. So I rent him out and you rent him from me. And foolishly, you don't take the, um, the insurance waiver and you return my slave and you've hurt his eye or his nose or his tooth and you have to, or his ear, and you have to pay me compensation. These laws also appear almost verbatim in the law code of Hammurabi. Another text, also broken. There's Murphy's Law of Assyriology, which is the more important the text, the more likely it is to be broken, and the more likely it is to be broken in the most annoying place possible. But this almost certainly can be restored. Ana ibn Adu Lugal Khatsura. To Ibn Adu, king of Khatsur. Ibn in Akkadian is Yabni, Yud Bet Nun in Hebrew, and this is the dynastic name Yabin, king of Khatsur. And we see a Yabin, of course, in Joshua and Judges, who's king of Chatzor. It's not the same person. It's be the same mistake as saying Queen Elizabeth of Shakespeare is the same as our contemporary Queen Elizabeth. But yet we do have the dynastic name showing us this continuity of culture. So, and, and this was recognized, for example, by Nehemia. In the book of Nehemia, it says, that the exiles in Babylonia have returned to the land from which Abraham went out. Moving ahead in history, we get to the division of the United Kingdom of Saul, David, and Solomon into two parts at the death, at the time of the death of Solomon the Northern Kingdom of Israel, the Southern Kingdom of Judah. Both of these would be swallowed up in one way or another by the great Assyrian Empire of the First Temple period. The Northern Kingdom, Israel, falling to the Assyrians in 721, leading to the exile and, well, traditional understanding of the disappearance of the 10 lost tribes. And Judah would become very, would become a colony of the Assyrian Empire. And we can see the Judeans themselves in history. For example, here on the, from the city of Lachish, the site of a major battle between the Assyrian forces in 701 on their way to Jerusalem. Here we see Judean exiles being taken from Lachish by Sennacherib. King of, Israel, King of Assyria and resettled somewhere in the Assyrian Empire. And this is part of the same traditional way that the Assyrian Empire dealt with exiles. They transferred people from one place to another and a people from that place back to another place, thereby attempting to break the ties of culture and politics that tied people to their homelands. And this is what lies behind this passage. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and so on and so on and placed them in the cities of Samaria and instead of the children of Israel and they possessed Samaria. But we have to not be, um, 
we shouldn't think of this as the Judeans or Israelites, the Jews being um, separated out for specially harsh treatment. This is not Nazi Germany. These are the typical ways that foreign, that the Assyrian and Babylonian empires dealt with rebellious peoples in the provinces. Everyone knew when you revolted against the Assyrians or the Babylonians, if you lost, this is what would happen to you. Yet they continued, not only the Israelites, but others continued to revolt, and they revolted against the Greeks, Hanukkah, Book of Maccabees, against the Romans. Um, the New Testament is set against um, the framework, the context of the Roman occupation of the land of Israel. And these revolutions, Masada, Bar Kokhba, they were part and parcel of the long history of the ancient Near East, leading to displaced peoples, leading to the development of exile communities throughout the ancient world. For example, the Jewish community of Alexandria, the Jewish community of Babylonia. Okay, where are we? So one of these communities was the Sumerian community of the city of Samaria. And this community continues to exist long after the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And this is demonstrated on these two coins from Samaria, here it is right there, where we find a icon of the, oh, I wish I had a shekel here. If you have a shekel in your pocket, take it out. And in the meantime, I'm gonna, here we are. The, I, I lost it again. It's hard to see. But, oh, here it is, right. This, this is the sign Shu, which gives us the Shin of Shomron. And in this one, we have a Sha, which gives us the Sh of the Shin of Shomron. So even a few hundred years, 400 years or so, after the time of the exile of the peoples from Babylonia into Samaria at the time of the Assyrians, there's still a Sumerian community identifying with Assyria and Babylonia in the land of Samaria. So these sociological, anthropological um, forces are not limited to the Judeans, not limited to Jews, to Israelites, but are th found throughout the ancient world. What's interesting though, is if you move 2,500 years forward, these most of these communities are now gone. Really, the only exilic community to survive the ancient period were the, the ancient Israelites and Judeans who evolved into the, the modern Jews. And we can, um, why this happened and how this happened for over 2,500 years is something which is worthy of discussion, but that's not our point here. We want to trace the first generations and see whether the models we find in the first generations of diaspora in our archive fit what we have, what fit the what we know about exilic communities down till today. And one of the places we had a very important Jewish community down until the near present was modern Mosul. Mosul in eastern Iraq, sorry, western Iraq on the Euphrates River, which you see here, is the traditional site of the, of, of um, it's, it's built across the river. We're, we're actually standing on the remains of Nineveh here, looking across the city, the main part of the city, looking across the Euphrates at Mosul. And Nineveh, of course, is where the prophet Jonah went to. And I would suggest that when Jonah got to Nineveh, he would have found a nice Jewish community there and gone to the synagogue and been invited for dinner for Friday night. The Jewish community in Mosul continued to exist down until the establishment of the State of Israel. You can see the 19, in 1938 photograph here of the leaders of the Jewish community in Mosul. And of course, Kevra Yonah, Jonah's um, grave, the traditional site, existed until recent times when ISIS blew it up. And you can see it here. Why they were blowing up the, the tomb of Jonah is beyond me, but 
I can't don't really understand their reasoning for lots of things, I guess. So we know some of the people who lived near Nineveh by name. For example, we have a certain person's name written in four signs. Il, the sign for the for a god, Ya A U. This is, of course, a cuneiform rendering of Eliyahu. And Eliyahu came from Nineveh. Naad biyahu, nadav yahu, also either of Nineveh or a nearby city, Dor Sharukin, and Ushea, Hosea, Yosaya, a Judean who came from the nearby city of Nimrod. So we know these people. We know them by name. And they're found exactly where we would expect them in the Assyrian capitals. Were they exiles who were sent there forcibly? Perhaps yes or perhaps no because Nineveh was one of these international cities like New York, like London, like Jerusalem, like Tel Aviv, like Rome, which was a magnet for people coming from all over the world. And it's very likely that Eliyahu, Nadav Yahu, and Oshea were not exiles who were sent in forced by force, but emigrated for various reasons and settled in their own communities, which were located in two towns in places like Nineveh, Nimrod, and so on. One of the most important Jew towns was that placed in the land of Babylonia. And now we are talking about a forced exile. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered the, the West, conquered the Levant, pushing out the Egyptian forces. And one of his main allies in doing this was Judah. Judah had fought on the side of the Babylonians against the Egyptians. And we know about this great battle where the king, where Judah and lost um, at Megiddo, Armageddon. But by 605, the Babylonians had come to the aid and had liberated the, um, liberated Judah from Egyptian control and the Judean Babylonian alliance based on the enemy of my enemy is my friend, this long uh, fight against the Assyrian Empire, which ended with the Babylonian conquest of Assyria in the late seven, in seven, between 714 and 709, meant that there was a long history of Judean Babylonian um, cooperation, leading to what most likely can be best described as a two-party system in the Judean government a pro-Babylonian party, including Jeremiah, and an anti-Babylonian party. The anti-Babylonian party took the upper hand, and in 598, Judah joined in a rebellion against the Babylonians. The re rebellion failed. Jehoiachim, king of Judah, was taken as hostage to Babylon, and we saw that he was given rations by the Babylonian king, as well as members of his family and his court. And now Zedekiah was placed on the throne as a Babylonian proxy. Nonetheless, again, in 587, 586, another revolt. And this time the Babylonians were not so nice. Destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the second temple, killed Zedekiah. And now we find the Judeans community in exile in Babylonia and we know where they went. This is um, Ezekiel 3.15. Then I came to them, then I, um, Ezekiel, came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv. The Avo el Hagola Tel Aviv, that dwelt by the river Chavar, Hayoshvim el Nahar Kvar, that's the Grand Canal. A share, and I sat where they sat, and they remained there appalled among them for seven days. So they're found at Tel Aviv, and that is part of the naming of the um, naming of the the city of Tel Aviv, modern Israel, Israeli Tel Aviv, on the river Chabar, and we can identify this city again as on the Chabar. Here's the Uru Kabara the city of the Kabar River, which would be located near ancient Tel Aviv. And we can place it right here following the ancient course 
of the Euphrates, which was followed, which was at this point being used. Well, the Euphrates had moved to the west, and it's likely that the ancient course was used as a guide to dig the Grand Canal right through central Babylonia, right through the area of the city of Shurapak. Shurapak is the place of the flood hero. And Abubu, cognate the Hebrew Aviv spring, means the spring flood in Babylonia, and also just flood in general. So there's an article by myself and my, my colleague, Peter Zilberg out. It's be published in the next few months in um, the Bib I can't do the biblical in what biblical note no biblical notices be in that will make the argument that Tel Aviv is sorry that um, Tel Aviv on the Chabar Canal is simply Shurapak or a new neighborhood of Shurapak. Like when you get to travel up north, you'll see the old Tel of Beitshan and then Roman Beitshan below it. And we believe that Tel Aviv, the hill of the flood, was the, the room mound of the flood was Shurapak. So you can now, I believe, identify where exactly Jer where exactly Ezekiel found the exiles. Right here in Shurapak, right here in our area where we know the Al Yehudu archives come from. The archives themselves consist of over 200 tablets. We're going to now spend the rest of our time talking about the archives. They consist of over 200 tablets, 44 of which were written at the town of Al Yehudu itself. We can't place Al Yehudu within within this um, block. Um, the excavations were not conducted by a university or official. Um, official archaeological body, such as the survey of the state of Iraq, but were conducted by independent, <laughs> I'm being nice here, they were looted um, and sold on the open market. But we do know from this group of 200 tablets, which were excavated together, which were found together, that there were three major towns in the immediate area, Al Yehudu, Beit Nashar, and Beit Abiram. Al Yehudu was a Judean town. There was a small, there was a minority Jewish community in Beit Nashar. Maybe I would estimate between a half and a third of the population. And Beit Abiram didn't have many Jews, if any, who actually lived, lived there. The archive in modern times was divided into two parts. The the, and, and let's talk about collections now, Rad. Archive means the entire archive of 200 plus tablets. Now we're talking about collections. And their archive is divided into three modern collections. Roughly 49% of the tablets, or 100 or so, end up in the collections of the British collectors, Cindy and David Sofer. And they're now on display at the Bible Lands Museum, Jerusalem, which if you haven't visited yet, hopefully you'll get a chance to visit. The, this part of the collection was entrusted to the publication of my dear friend, Dr. Laurie Pierce of the University of California, Berkeley, and has appeared in press in this book, Documents of Judean Exiles and West Semites in Babylonia in the collections of David Sofer. Another 49% or so was ended up in the collections of the Scandinavian collector Shoyan, and we're entrusted to Dr. Cornelia Wunsch of the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, and her publication of this group is expected four years ago. Um, any day now, or who knows when. Nonetheless, a, based on confidentiality agreements, um, many of the, the core group, including myself, of people studying these tablets have had access to Cornelia Wunsch's group of tablets and we know what's there. We just can't um, talk about it completely freely for that. I apologize, but I have to honor my agreement. That in addition to this material, there are a few odds and ends. 
that belonged to an Israeli collector, Shlomo Musayev, who passed away recently. And many of these were published by Kathleen Abraham of Bar Ilan University, who's now in Belgium. And um, one of these is the, the Kabar tablet, the city on the Kabar tablet that we've looked at in the Bible Lands Museum. How exactly they ended up on the antiquities market and came to the West and were divided the way they divided um, is unclear. But happily, by, by happenstance, the group that includes most of the tablets from Al Yahudu, most of the tablets that are interest of interest from the perspective of the history and sociology of the Judean community of, of ba the Babylonian exile ended up in the Sofer collection and therefore have been published and are available in the publications of, in the publication of Laurie Pierce and therefore available for study. The time frame of the, of the documents themselves, documents as we'll see in a moment are dated by year, month, and day. And they date to an our counting 572 to 477 BC or late in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, through the tail end of the, old, of the Babylonian empire, Evil Meridoth, Nereglesar, Labashi Marduk, and Nabonidus, and after the conquest of the Babylonians, after the conquest of Babylonia by the Persians, the time of Cyrus the Great, Cambyses, Darius the Great, and Xerxes, including the time of the, the revolts of 522 and 521. We do have one or two texts which date to these revolts against, um, uh, the, these revolts at the time of the transition from Cambyses to Darius. In Jewish terms, we're talking about the beginning of the second temple period down to roughly the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're talking about a time, a period that includes some very important events in the history of ancient Israel, including this event recorded in the very last, the very last verse of the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Koamar Koresh Melech Parah. Thus says Koresh, Cyrus, king of Persia. All the kingdoms of the earth has the Lord, the God of heaven, given me. And he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you of all his people, the Lord his God be with him, let him go up. This is the Edict of Cyrus, which establishes, proclaims the rebuilding of the temple and the start of the second temple period. There's two very interesting note, things to note here in the original Hebrew. He said, he commanded me or entrusted me, charged me, leave not lo baya, to build him a house, a temple, be Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, Asher be Yehuda, which is in Judah. Now, why is he saying Jerusalem, Asher be Yehuda, Jerusalem, which is in Judah? Because there are other Jerusalems, including Jerusalem and Babylonia. And the last word of the Bible is very, very optimistic, via al, let him go up, from the same root as aliyah, or up, or like Mosa elite, um, and so on. So, by the time of Cyrus, the Judeans have a chance to go home. Do they go home? Some of them do, but certainly not all of them. And if you want to see, you know, what that's like, just look at the Jewish communities of the United States, of Western Europe, of um, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union states. Not everyone comes back to Israel when given the chance. And the same is true of ancient Babylonia, the time of the al Yehudu archives stretching from the time of Nebuchadnezzar down to the time of Xerxes goes vast for more than 50 years after we can place the date of the Edict of Cyrus. So in this period, we, in this hundred, just under 100 years, we find from generation to generation Judeans living in the Al Yehudu settlement block, guarding their Judean identities. We find, that, for example, Yaffa and Rafi, a married couple, Yaffa Yahu and Rafi Yawa. Um, 
many of the Judean names then, Hebrew names, Judean, Israelite, Jewish, just like the modern names are the same names. They include the name of the God of Israel and Sid, Sidkiyawa and Abdiyahu. So we have um, Zedekiah and Ovadia and we have Yafayahu, Yafa and Raphayawa, um, Rafi. So we have a, a, a Yafa and a Rafi. If you open the Jerusalem phone book today, you're going to find lots of Rafis married, Raphaels and Rafis married to lots of Yafas. Okay, that shouldn't be there. Okay, we also, of course, find these names in the documentation. And what you're looking at here is the transliteration of a list of, of a document which at face value seems to be possibly the most boring thing you could ever imagine. What happens is this. In order to collect taxes on agricultural land, one has to know what the value of the agricultural produce is. If you're dealing with wheat and barley, this can be calculated simply by the amount of land that's being cultivated. But dates is a different matter because the amount of dates you'll get from date trees depends on the age of the date trees, the condition of the land, which is not just this year and last year, but goes back to the planting of the trees and many other variables. So date trees have to be inspected to, and tax has to be assessed by an assessor. And what we have here is a list of names and how much area they, of dates they have, how big their date plantation is, and what their tax is. And if you look at the names, Sariah, that's a name that we find still among Jews, Yahu Kulu, that's a Yahu name, Nechiyama, Nechemia, Banayama, another Yama, Yahweh name, the MW split is, is, the M is also for W, Katibama, Abdu Yahu, Ovadia, the same name as in Islam, Ab, Abdullah, and it goes on another Abdiyahu, and then this lovely name here in line 11, Yali Yama, so Yali Yawa. And this is exactly the same word, same root as Viyaal. Our text here comes from 519 BC, about 20 years after the Cyrus Edict, and what we can imagine is in this excitement, a couple named their child Yaliyama, God will take him up in the hope, in the, in, the, in the expectation that their child would not grow up in Babylon in exile, but would grow up back in the land of Israel, the land where they're, at this point in 519, their, 539, their grandparents and great-grandparents had been exiled from, from the, time, the time of Nebuchadnezzar. But of course, the family doesn't go, and we find Yaliyama here being assessed for it, the dates in his date plantation. We also find uh, a marriage contract where we find it, uh, witnesses who are Jews. My student, Janet Safra, is not making, <coughs> I think, a very convincing argument that both sides of the family here are Judean, are Israelite, and they all have, they, they have Hebrew names, and she can connect them to some, connect these names to some of the major figures in the Al Yehudu archive. We have just general um, economic documents. This is a contract for leasing lands for barley cultivation, and what we see is the Judeans and the Israelites, the Jews of Al Yehudu and the Al Yehudu settlement block, doing what people do in their everyday life. They're making partnerships for plowing with oxen, they're buying and selling property, they're renting houses, they're buying up inheritances, all the things that we all do, all the topics that we will all find in our own family and personal papers for today. It says, if someone dug up the contents of my wallet and my personal files 2,500 years from now and could reconstruct the life of my community and my neighbors based on all our materials. And they're doing exactly what Ezekiel is telling them to do, to build a new life in Babylonia, to um, Jeremiah 29, 5 and 6, build your houses and dwell in them, 
and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them, take yourself wives and seek the peace of the city, and so on, and so on. In Jewish liturgy till today, after the Torah is read on Saturday morning, a prayer is offered to the local for this for the praying for the well-being of the local land that you're in in britain this is a prayer for the king and queen of england in the united states for the president of the united states and his and his um his or hers um uh, officials and in israel of course this is uh, comes a prayer for the state of the state of israel okay so that is the main part of the presentation why don't we take uh, a short break to see if any questions you have, and then we'll close by taking a look at two or three of the actual text. So if you have questions now, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask. Nope, okay. So, Let's look at this text. This isn't from Al Yehuda, but it's a little bit later on. And it's a really nice text. This is the transliteration, but here's a summary. Okay, there are five Judeans. There's some uh, one whose name is missing, and he's the son of Bel Abba Utsor. So we do have Judeans who have uh, Babylonian names in their family in much the same way that um, I have a brother Aaron, which is a nice Jewish name, but also a brother Brian and Darren, and who knows what my parents were thinking when they named me Wayne. We have Chacham, son of Ishia, a Josiah, Natan, son of Tabshalam, a nice Jewish name, and Zavadiyama, a Zavadia, son of Chinibel. Chinibel is a nice Babylonian name. It means the grace of the Lord. And it's, of course, the same name as Hannibal. So we have Zavadia, son of Hannibal. And they sign a contract with a Babylonian named Remut Ninurta, who supplies the partners with fishing nets in exchange for 500 quality fish for 15 days or 1,000 fish for 20 days. Looks very mundane, not interesting. But what's interesting here is the date the 25th of Elul, 419 BC, 170 years after the destruction of the temple. Comes from a city called Tituri, the bridge. And most of you are probably not expert in the Hebrew calendar, but the 25th of Elul is late August. And five days later is the Jewish New Year. And 10 days after that is Yom Kippur. So there's our 15 days. And five days after that is the day before. Five days after that is Sukkot. So this is Jewish guys getting together and saying, hey, if we get lots of fish, we can make a lot of money selling them to the Jewish community for the high holidays. And this is um, just like I just went to the market, the, the supermarket, to look for gefilte fish, because in my family we have this gefilte fish, which, which means um, filled fish. It's, uh, however, do you guys have gefilte fish ever? You should have gefilte fish on Passover. Um, it's kind of disgusting, but nonetheless, it's traditional. Moroccans have a, a much better dish of this very spicy uh, fish, but nonetheless, it's traditional. And we see here people, Jews being Jews, doing what Jews do to this day, um, more than 20, you know, 20, 2,500 years ago. Okay, let's take a look at this one, just as an example of an administrative text. Okay, the first, these texts can be divided into three parts. You have the main, the main, um, the main text, which is the economic transaction, a list of witnesses, and then the date and place of writing. So the witnesses are Hashbi Yama, Yawa, Judean name, Palat Yama, Judean name, Shalom Yama, Judean name, son of Tab Shalom, Judean name, and the scribe. It's written in Al Yehudu in Judah town on the ninth day of Kislimu, which is in December. Um, 
16 days before the Hanukkah festival, the fourth year of Nabonidus, king of Babylon, which brings us to 552 BC, approximately two generations after the destruction of the temple. And it's a very boring text. A certain amount of barley are owed to Baal Sha'utzor, son of Nuba, by Sid Kiyama. You know what? Let's not do it this way. Let's just look at the actual order. This amount of barley belonging to Baal Sha'utzor, the son of Nubaya, is on the head of Sid Kiyama. So Sid Kiyama borrowed this, um, this barley, and he's the son of Shalima. And then for each this amount, um, he will pay an extra amount of interest. So there's your interest. In the month of Sivan, in the spring, at the gate of the storehouse where the barley is brought after the harvest, he will pay it out. So someone takes a loan in barley to be repaid at the time of the barley harvest. Very simple. Notice the name here, Belshar Utsar son of Numa. Let's move on, this one too, except here we find the same exact type of text two years later in 550, but here the name of the person is not Baal Shar Utsor, but is Yahu Shar Utsor. So may God protect Yahu, the God of Israel, instead of may God protect the Lord. And why has this happened? Well, it's either possible that Yahu Shar Utsar and Bil Shar Utsar are brothers, but more likely that they're the same person, because Bel Shar Utsar is the same name as Belshazzar that we know from the Bible. And it was not considered polite to have the same name as the king. And Belshazzar as the crown prince and acting king in Babylon would have been considered the king. So Bel Sha'utzor, the Lord, and instead of using the Lord, we just use the personal name of the God of Israel, Yahu Sha'utzor. And this proves that Yahu Sha'utzor is Baal, is Baal, is the Lord. And the use of Baal, Baal, to describe the God of Israel, I'm wondering, just wondering, if this is not an indication that Baal Sha'utzor, Yahu Sha'utzor, is not Southern, is not Judean, but is from the north, is actually an Israelite. But that's something that we can't know. Okay. Last text. You ready? Oh, okay. One more text. Here's uh, two more texts. Yeah, I think you'll like this one. Urkatu Sharat, daughter of Beat Il Shuro and life of Kina, voluntary gave to Sili Nana one red five-year-old ox. What's a red ox? Para aduma. Red includes brown and shades, and red is everything from purple to brown. So if you wonder what a para aduma is, what the, the, red, um, the red cow is in the Bible, that's what we're talking about here. We find one in a economic tablet. Oops, and, oops, okay. Can, uh, got cut off, okay. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Here we go. Almost there. The Kavar Canal. The front of our translation of the books. Here you have the name of one of those protagonists of this text written in Hebrew. This is the earliest Hebrew that we have from the diaspora. And the question then becomes, why write in Hebrew on the side of a cuneiform tablet? And we believe that this was written in order for, uh, we find these on the, these writings in the local, in the alphabetic script in what's mostly Aramaic on about seven to 8% of the tablets. 
but this is the only one written in Hebrew. And this, in fact, is the earliest Hebrew that we find from the Babylonian diaspora. And I ask you beforehand to take out a shekel. If you turn over your shekels, you know what? Yeah, you have a shekel? Okay, I'm gonna go get one. So just bear with me so that makes sure everyone can see a shekel. I have returned with my shekel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can no one see that now? If you can see it, just give me a thumbs up so that I know that you're seeing it. Okay. So if you look at the shekel, you can see right over here, you have ancient first temple script. This, shek this side of the shekel coin, yes, exactly, is based on a Roman coin from the Bar Kokhba revolt, which uses the first temple script. Why does it use the first temple script? It's like an icon of bringing, heralding or connecting modern Israel and the modern shekel to the ancient Jewish world, to the ancient coin. And it's exactly the same type of icon of um, political iconography that we found on the Samaria coin that we looked at earlier. But more importantly, this script lives on. So the script that we find, the earliest script in the diaspora has in effect come home to modern Israel and is found now on Israeli coinage. The ancient world and the modern world are not so far apart. And I think it's clear, at least I hope it's clear after our discussions of today, that the um, the model of how you preserve a cultural and identity con continuity, how you preserve your religious traditions, um, goes back is, is, is the model of Jeremiah, of living your lifetime, passing on your heritage to your sons of daughters, passing them passing on their heritage generation by generation in an unbroken link. And this is what allows us to continue to be Jews so many thousands of years after the destruction of the first and second temple, as well as Christians to remain Christians 2,000 plus years after the events of the New Testament, allows Muslims to be Muslims 1,500 years after the time of Muhammad. And we find this, these mechanisms attested in writing in the very first time, I believe, in the Al Yehudu archives that I've enjoyed so much sharing with you today. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yeah. You have to un uh, unmute uh, yourself. Yes, uh, you have a question, Vera? Yes. And um, you were talking about the names in uh, of, uh, of the, um, let's say, Jews. Uh, in there in Babylon, and you were mentioning that some of them had the name like Baal or, Baal or something like yes. that. Because I've also I was uh, I heard that uh, in Chronicles, for example, there are two names that then in Samuel you find them in the two, like Mephibosheth is called Mary Baal. Yeah. Uh, is there any kind of connection or like you was that yes, exactly. like usual? Mm. Yeah, the, the connection is it in the main line of Jewish tradition, it became unacceptable. The name Baal, Lord, is just is not the name of the Canaanite storm god. The name of the Canaanite mm. storm god is Hadad, Adad, Hadu, 
um, the name which still occurs in many names in the, you know, Hadad. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Adad of Hatzor, Adad of Aleppo, mm -hmm. and so on. The Lord refers to any, any important mm -hmm. deity. But yeah. because of the close connections in Hebrew tradition between the term Baal, Lord, and the Canaanite storm god, in the south in Judah, it became unacceptable to use that name. So all the Baal names were replaced by Boshe, like Ish Baal, the crown prince, is mm. known as Ish Boshe. And Boshe just means shame. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, but the, the original name was Baal. And in the north, I would guess, it was remained acceptable to call um, just the way that um, we say, you know, the Lord for, for, for God is mm -hmm. totally okay. There's no um, prohibition or tradition against doing that. And I think that was true in the North. And I think that based on that, I think we can argue that the names such as Bill Charlotte's or, or Yahoo Charlotte's or are probably Northerners rather than Southerners. But that is, um, that needs to be looked at in great detail. Remember these archives are only now, the, even we're not, we don't have the whole archive out. We only have about half. We're still waiting on Cornelia Lynch's text. There's probably there's you know countless other texts on the ground that we have access to. Mm. So it's going to take us, the academic community, another 50 to 100 years to sort all this out. And mm. so um, we're only in the infancy of these discussions. But this is one of the topics that are under is under academic consideration. Mm. What kind of other texts were they like? Were they all more, mostly commercial or? They're all commercial. Mm -hmm. except for one marriage contract mm -hmm. just all commercial documents of one kind or another but nonetheless they're so i mean i really believe that this is the most important archive of ancient texts mm -hmm. for Jewish history other than the dead sea scrolls the dead sea scrolls of course giving us um religious philosophical mm -hmm. theological material we don't have any of that here all we have is the in a sense the opposite the day-to-day -day lives of these people through their economic transactions and contracts. So they were mostly like, uh, well, what kind of activities or what kind of, uh, like they were fishermen, they were uh, They were fishermen, and... they were farmers. Um, the richer people were dealing in um, real estate speculation. Mm. And there you can see in the, the name, many of the names that repeat themselves, these families accumulating great wealth Mm -hmm. and on their way to becoming the great trading trading um on their way to becoming the rothschilds so mm -hmm. on their day mm -hmm. um there's a very important trading house called Rashu that we know later on from babylonia from the mm -hmm. 400s and it's possible that it's very likely that the is, is a, 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 it's a jewish family judean family mm -hmm. Rashu in babylonia means cat and so they would just be the Cass family or something yeah. like that. <laughs> mm. But that, that ultimate link between Murashu and, and the Jewish family still needs to be demonstrated. We still have a missing link or two in proving this. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Question? Yes. I think you have mentioned that there was one Jewish family where you have a record of four generations. Uh, Five how is generations. that possible? Five generations. It goes back. You have one. You have a generation in the land of Israel. The grants. The original. The father. Each of these names is father and son. So the father is born in Judah, is exiled. Then his son is then mentioned, and then you just have three more generations in Babylonia, stretching from the 580s down to the 470s. But how can, how can you trace it over such a long period of time? I know that it's the same family. Because you just simply follow, follow father and son. You okay. have, it's, and you follow what they're doing and the father disappears when this, what happens is the father, the father disappears from the records as the son takes over the business. So the son then becomes the one running the business and then he passes away and his son is the one running the business. And so there's a whole series of texts, not just right, one. Right, right, not, not just one. No, no, there's a whole, in these families we find 20, 30 
text, Janet Safford um, is, is in the process of building the argument that the entire archive more or less is linked together by, um, by a single family, that everything ultimately goes back to the single family archive. And then almost all the tablets, not all the tablets, almost all the tablets have something to do with some member of this large extended family. Now I'm wondering what this find does to some of the scholars who love to denigrate the scriptures and try to prove that it's ancient mythology and they're asking for hard evidence. And some of them, it seems, even when they get the hard evidence, their ideology is stronger than the evidence. Well, anyone, I mean, people say that this is was forged. So, I mean, you, you can't, you can't convince, if, you can't convince people that fake news is news if they believe that it's fake news, or you can't, you, 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 if people are willing to say that someone was went out and managed to forge 200 tablets, giving us new names, new verbal forms, um, new ways of writing text, and so on, then there's nothing, you know, you, you're not dealing with, with rational thought here. You're dealing with something else. I don't want to give it a name, but you're dealing with something else. And from talking with Laurie and Cornelia, I know how hard they struggled with dealing with a new archive. It's, these texts are very poorly written. They're written by second class scribes working out in the rural periphery. They're not written by the royal scribes in, in the royal court. And they've done a, a, a remarkable job in reading these texts. There's still going to be corrections because there always are. And if you want perfection, you'll never get publication. But there's no way, there's no way that anyone could, could forge these documents. These are genuine. So um, and then in answer to the first part of the question, um, I mean, you have documentary evidence um, for Jeremiah and for Ezekiel. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel are rooted in the time of the ideologies and theologies of David and Solomon and earlier. So I don't know how you, um, you know, how you can still argue that that the first temple period is is a is a fictional construct, especially since at the other end of the first temple period you have the House of David inscription, which mentions the House of David within um, within living memory of the death of King Solomon. You can't make that stuff up, and it's uh, and. The people who excavated Biram and um, who else published that? The House of David inscription. I don't know if you've dealt with that yet. I assume at some point you'll deal with it in, in your in your discussions. But there's no way you can force these things. Um, people saw them come out of the ground. You would have to have a vast international conspiracy. Biram and Naveh. You'd have to have a vast international conspiracy. It just doesn't hold water anymore. The, the the textual evidence in cuneiform contemporary to the first temple period both the beginning and end um prove that the first temple period is historical of course the the biblical text is not a history notebook it presents things in a in a manner which is um, reflecting the ideology and theology of the of the ancient israelites um, religion and, and political state and institutions, but it doesn't mean it's not historical. It's 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 historical. It's just not giving us perhaps a, a it's not giving us newspaper history. It's giving us ideological political history. Yes, sir. Yes, so um, thank you. Uh, just wondering if you find any variations in the spelling of the names of kings like Cyrus. Some, some yes, commentators lots, say lots. that say that um, Darius could be Cyrus Cyrus um, in in the Book of Daniel. No, no, you don't find that kind of variation. But there are there are slight variations in writing because you're using a sign system, and these variations allow you to begin to looking at um, dialectical differences. For example, with the Hebrew names. We believe that ultimately you'll be able to demonstrate that um, there that the Masoretic the Masoretic rendering of biblical Hebrew matches that of Al Yehudu, 
but that you also have um, other renderings, um, perhaps going to the Northern Kingdom. And you do have, in addition, excuse me, to the Masoretic text, I have to sneeze, but you obviously <laughs> can't get Corona by, um, by internet, <laughs> but don't worry. Go ahead. Uh, so it's that that we're ultimately going to be able to pick out elements of the northern dialect of Hebrew. Once we can pick those out, we can go back into the biblical text and look for material which is set in a northern context. For example, um, uh, um, Jezebel and and, Re and and those types of things, and then we can correlate these against each other, correlate these against names we might find on Ostrakhan, and begin to unravel some of what's going on in the in the north in northern Hebrew but uh, but this is this requires such fine attention to, to it's it's really like looking for needles in the haystack or needles in haystacks but once you get enough haystack and you'll get enough needles to do something and the al Yehudu text is the first time we actually have enough haystack to begin to looking for these needles and we're really to you to push this analogy to as far as I can go, it's the first time we actually have these needles to to play with, and um, that's where we are right now. We have the needles, and now we have to put it all together. Yeah, it's amazing. Thanks. And there's more. There's more needles in that haystack. We just haven't found them all yet. So we're still looking for needles. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Okay, pick, pick one, one of you, either one. Yes. Yeah, one is, uh, these people were taken to Babylon and exile, so they were slaves in the beginning time. And uh, days passed, they engaged in lots of business, uh, they were, farming. Right, they weren't they, exactly uh, slaves. They were, they were dependents of the Babylonian king. They were originally sent there, and the first thing they did was to their first task was to dig, redig um, the canal system, because without redigging the canal system, they couldn't farm. Once the canal systems were dug, they were able, they were given, well, they were forced to enter into agreements. They were given royal land on the basis of service for land. So they had to pay taxes, and they also had to offer two months of service like reserve duty to the to the to the crown to the and we have in one of the topics handled um, that repeats itself in the archive is Judeans paying other Judeans and others to do their reserve duty, having to go to Susa, for example, to participate in the great building projects of the Persian Empire. If you were rich enough, you didn't have to go yourself; you could send pay somebody else to go for you. So the status oh, of the people still continued as slaves? They're not slaves. They're not owned by another person. They are, in effect, crown property. They belong to the king. And okay. they operate independently. And they, they're, if you want to use them, um, the people on the land are more serf than slave. But they don't have to work the land. As long as you pay your taxes, then the king doesn't care what you do. So there are Judeans who do well and just lease out their land to other people to work and get involved in business. And this is part and parcel of building capital and leading to these, these banking families, ultimately. The, one of the, 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 the one of the, uh, these are, one of the um, banking families seems to have its roots in Babylonia in the beer trade. Beer is always something that's quite lucrative. And it looks like the third, that a junior branch of the family was sent to establish the, the, the branch of the family in Al Yehudu. You can compare this to, for example, um, rich families in Britain sending their third or fourth son to Australia or South Africa or Singapore or Hong Kong to establish their branch of the family in these places when the first son and second son might have remained in London 
And I think that's the mechanism that we're looking at here, which is uh, a mechanism that is used to build diaspora uh, communities. But again, we're working on this. This still needs to be developed. Okay, thank you, thank you. And another one is, we have lots of commercial documents at these 200 tablets, but uh, we deal with the scripture. So is there any evidence for the scriptures as part of these cuneiform tablets? They, not direct. There's, this, people have calculated whether or not economic activity is happening on the Jewish Sabbath. There does seem to be a very distinct decrease of activity on the Jewish Sabbath. There are a few tablets which do seem to have activity on the Jewish Sabbath, but remember that the tablets are not dated on the basis of the activity. They're dated on the basis of the writing of the tablet, which could report, for example, on the scribe could, there could be the transaction on Friday and the scribe writes up the tablet on Saturday. The other place that you can find indirect evidence is, um, okay, it flew out my ear, is the Sabbath and interest. Um, there's a, a long discussion about the issue of interest and that's also a, a, whether or not Judeans are charging other Judeans interest in line with, um, in line with biblical prohibition. It is possible that the, the interest on the prohibition of interest, basically there are three, three currencies, silver, barley, dates. Barley transactions generally are set around the spring harvest, date transactions around the date harvest in the fall, and silver, of course, is good all year round. It is possible to hypothesize that the prohibition of interest is only on silver, not on dates and barley. And that's something that needs to be looked at. So it's a prohibition of interest on money, not on commodities, because commodities grow. Money, you can't, you can't put silver in the ground and expect it to grow, whereas barley and dates um, do grow, and also barley and dates um, have, like if I borrow, barley's good for three years. So if I borrow barley in, if I borrow 100 pounds, 100 quarts of barley from you from last year's harvest, and I'm paying you back 100 quarts of barley from next harvest, the 100 quarts of the new barley is worth more in silver than the 100 quarts of the old barley. How does that deal with interest? There's obviously, in terms of silver, interest, but in terms of barley, there's no interest there. And these are the issues that have types of issues we have to look at. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay, I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about uh, the Jews, Judean and Israelite. Uh, the Judean referring to Judah, and Israelite referring to the northern tribes, and the Jews to refer to both uh, Judah and the northern tribes. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, I'm using Jews as an anachronism for lack of a better term. I could use the term Hebrews. So where I said Jews, you could also just use Hebrews. Um, so, uh, so my question is relating to the term Jews. As far uh, we have been like, I've uh, been thinking like the Jews refer to the, exclusively to the groups that returned from Babylon in three different times. First, starting with Cyrus and the Northern tribes, they don't have any records of their return from Assyria. So they were called like Samaritans, uh, hybrid Jews, so. I thought the Jews was exclusive term referring to the tribe of Judah who returned from Babylon and captivity. Uh, that that is the line of traditional Judea, traditional Judaism. Yes, I don't believe that that will historically be able to be sustained. Okay, uh, with that, uh, is there uh, any articles or resource that we can uh, look at and uh, try to learn more about those? Thoughts? Um. 
too early, too early in the discussions. Um, I think the model that you need to look at is, let's say, let's take the Jewish community of the current United States. Mm -hmm. This community consists basically of three layers. You have the earliest settlers who came at the time of the co colonial settlement, mostly from Spain. And they settled in um, the Caribbean and in um, Florida and so on. In the 1800s, you had uh, immigration from Germany who basically overwhelmed the numbers of people who were there beforehand. And the Germans in turn were overwhelmed by the immigrants in the late 18th and early, late 19th and early 20th century from, the, from Eastern Europe, Poles, Russians, Hungarians, and so on. So they all look today as to be one community, but actually they are, modern American Jews are a compilation of lots of different communities and different waves of immigration. And I think that's what you actually, that, and it's also the same, the same, um, I won't say fiction, but the same legend. Why do all Americans eat turkey on the fourth day of, of November, fourth Thursday of November, because of the, the pilgrims and the Mayflower and this whole thing. It doesn't, the story doesn't matter, but all Americans share this legend that they all celebrate together whether or not their ancestors were on the Mayflower. And clearly my ancestors in the United States, my parents, my whole family is in the States except for me, my brothers and sisters' ancestors didn't come over on the Mayflower. I know that they came to the Statue of Liberty in the 1920s. So um, the, 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 that the, 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 the contemporary constructs, be they modern contemporary constructs or ancient contemporary constructs are not always reflective of what actually happened. And I would argue that many of the Northerners ended up being um, absorbed by the Southern community. And then for example, you have Josiah's appeal to the Northerners, and they're already living in Judah. Um, you have this great population increase in Judah at, after the fall of the Northern Kingdom. So there's lots of Northerners living within what we see as Judeans. And, and we, okay. uh, yes, I have heard about uh, that, that theory, like uh, some of the Northern tribes absorbing in Judah, the Judah tribe. Uh, okay, thank you for now. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. One more question, and that is on this matter of Jewish, where in the area of your expertise, Assyriology, the Assyrian officer was challenging the Jewish defenders on the wall of Jerusalem. And we have the first mention in the scriptures of how the Jewish officials are shouting back and saying, don't talk to us in Yehudit, but talk to us in Aramit. Yes, and so they that the it's clear that the officer there was was an Israelite in the service of the Assyrian army. And seven hundred one, the Northern Kingdom, the former lands of the Northern Kingdom, and former population of the Northern Kingdom would have been a generation into the Assyrian Empire. And the, they do say Yehudit, so that he's speaking in the, what they can identify with the Southern dialect of, um, of, um, of Hebrew. So he might actually be a Judean who grew up in Nineveh or parts of Judah also were taken by the Assyrians. So um, yeah, there's, there's, things are much more complicated. Um, just as today, you know, when we look at trying to define who is a Jew and half Jews or not half Jews, matrilineal descent, patrilineal descent. Um, you know, you go around the world and you try and, and, and you know, it's one of the things that's popular these days is getting your genetic makeup and you find out that you're 7% Neanderthal and God knows what else. Um, these things are, um, I really think it's kind of neat that that white people have more Neanderthal in them than, than, than black people who are more homo sapien. 
that sort of sends a lot of like 19th century theory of uh, humanity and turns it on its head, I think it's just lovely. I like having the end of all blood. Um, but these things are incredibly complicated and complex. And, um, and the, we, we have to, I, I think we have to separate out, um, uh, you know, this is now a theological discussion. Now I'm not talking as an academic, I'm talking as myself, is I, I think that we have to look at the biblical text as being a record, but not pressuring it in, in such a way that everything has to be historically proved in order for us to retain its faith. I think that what we see from Al Yehudu is that the, the the historical narrative is the being given in its fullness and its message is exactly consistent. The biblical narrative is exactly consistent or consistent with what we find in the cuneiform documentation. We don't need to make sure that each and every fact is remembered correctly because we're dealing with hundreds of years. And over hundreds of years, you know, stories, narratives change. It's the same, you know, the game we used to play, I used to play as a child. You put 15 kids in a line and you tell the first person a message and he whispers that into the ear of the second person. And by the time you get to the 15th person, it's completely changed. And we have to agree for, that these things are, are, these things are changing and there's disagreements in contemporary world. You look at the news on CNN, on the news and Fox News, sometimes you're looking at two different worlds. It's hard to believe they're reporting the same events. So the, these are human failings or, hum, or human characteristics. They're not failings of the divine story, I think, and uh, divinity. And um, I've gone off on a, on a tangent there, but anyway, um, not really, it's a fantastic conclusion and we are immensely grateful to you for being willing to, in this Zoom technology world that's developing, to have so successfully shown the material and uh, so that we can share your enthusiasm that these records are on second only to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And with that, we want to thank you and we'll sign off with deep gratefulness. My pleasure always. I look forward to having dinner with you as soon as possible. You owe me a dinner. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. Be careful out there, folks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it was really good.